And well, welcome all. My name is uh, George Kiki, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of LebNet, and I will be moderating this session today. First, let me go through some housekeeping items. Let me try to share the slide here for a second. So basically, we, we're, um, all of you, uh, the participants are gonna be joining through video, you're actually muted. Um, and um, if you have any logistics issues, please uh, chat directly with uh, Najib Khouri Haddad. Uh, who's, who's going to be facilitating this in the background. Additionally, Najib is going to be looking at your uh, Q&A questions. Please submit any Q&A questions in the, chat, in the Q and A box, and uh, that will be curated and moderated lately at the end of the session. Najib will, uh, will actually take care of that, and uh, we're actually recording the session as well as live streaming it on YouTube. So if any of your friends uh, connect with you and tell you we can't get in, uh, just tell them to go to the LebNet YouTube channel and uh, they, can, they can follow there. So without further ado, let me um, go to the next slide and show our panel today. So this webinar on AI solutions and how they're impacting, um, impacted by COVID-19 is a third in a series of webinars that LebNet is organizing uh, to keep our stakeholders engaged, at least until we can resume our in-person events. Uh, these continue to be extraordinary times we live in, and the new normal presents many challenges and opportunities. AI solutions, like many others, are deeply affected. So the question is, which applications will see delays? Which areas will see accelerated adoption? We will try to shed some light today on how some organizations are adapting and innovating during this pandemic and beyond. We're extremely pleased to bring you today's session on AI, and I want to personally thank our panelists for making the time out of their busy schedule. We have uh, Johnny Gabriel. Uh, he's VP of Data Science and Solution Architecture at Beyond. Anthony Tayoun is co-founder and COO, as well as CFO at uh, Dex AI Robotics, and George Trud, VP of Product at Casisto. Uh, George, thank you again for, as you're on London, UK time, and uh, it's 8 p.m. your time right now, so thank you for, for making the time uh, so late in the evening. My pleasure, guys. Great. Uh, so next, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be uh, asking each of the panelists to uh, introduce themselves. They're gonna be sharing a couple of slides uh, to do that. So they're gonna describe what their company does um, as well as uh, what they do. Um, and uh, please uh, also for the panelists, if you're, um, if you're not talking, if you can also mute yourselves, there's a little bit of feedback. Okay, so without further ado, Johnny, uh, can you please briefly introduce yourself and describe what your firm focuses on? Um, and I'm sharing your slides right now. Thank, thank you, George. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, my name is Johnny Gabriel. I'm the Vice President of uh, Data Science and Business Solution Architecture at Beyond. Um, as George mentioned, we're in the telecom space. Um, what we focus on, just a high-level view, is, is we focus on using AI for automating analytical tasks that occur within a telecommunications operator. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a huge web of pipes and fiber and antennas and, and spectrum and all these things, and it, it obviously connecting people today. Our goal has been to uh, apply AI for operational automation. And uh, one of the key things we focus on is, is admit all of the technology that's involved in delivering uh, connectivity to people is, is making the focus on people. So um, we'll talk about the impact of COVID and all the things that occur in a, in a telecommunications network to, to get the bits and bytes from one place to the next but making sure we measure what happens to uh, the end customer is, is, is effectively what, what Beyond is focused on. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, George, for today, uh, the, the focus obviously is on COVID and the impact of that on telecommunications. And um, I, it's, it's, it's obviously a hard time for everyone, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the telecom operators, I think is one of the few beneficiaries of, of COVID, um, you know, overnight, uh, our 
all of our personal interactions have somehow transformed onto internet interactions like <laughs> today's panel, which uh, we've done in person before. The, the picture in the background actually is our latest happy hour. Um, it's the same way I spent my Easter this year, pretty much the same way. My, my dad, who's, who's in his 70s, spent his first uh, virtual Easter <laughs> this year due to COVID. But all of it obviously is running on, uh, uh, these, on these mobile and fixed uh, networks. And the, these, these companies have now become you know, the, the, the lifeline for, for, you know, we've always been connected recently, but this is, this is a different time for them for sure. Um, if we go to the next slide, if you don't mind, George. So at a high level, what, what has been the impact? Um, as I mentioned, I mean, obviously it brings challenges. There's a lot more stress on these networks. Uh, it's transformed from, you know, business has moved from, you know, a lot of condensed uh, fixed sites to where everybody distributed to their homes. Uh, there's lower customer touch points where you before you used to call for the technician to come and wiggle the cable at your house. Now you want them nowhere close. So moving into self-support and uh, changing the operational models has been definitely challenging. And no surprise that the internet traffic has, has spiked, right? 25% uh, on average for major cities. And, you know, cities, you know, like countries like South Korea, maybe not, not so much impact, but like Southern Italy has seen a 40% spike, which is, you know, astronomical if, if you think the scale of, of how these networks are built. Um, but it has been, there has been actually, when I said beneficiaries in, in the sense that it's been a compelling event for a lot of things that uh, the telecom industry has been waiting for, from releasing spectrum to allow more mobile applications to, you know, reducing regulations for building out bigger capacity for these networks. It has been, it has sort of sparked a lot of urgency on things that have been in, on, in the back burner for a while. So there's, there's pluses and minuses, but in the end uh, with COVID, the main focus has been on uh, making sure people stay connected. I think so far they've done actually a phenomenal job. Um, I, I personally would have expected a lot more disruption, but so far, you know, it's, uh, it's held up pretty well. So uh, we're, we're happy to be part of those solutions as well. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's... Uh... Let's move on to George Trad at Casisto. George, you want to please introduce yourself and your company? Thank you, George. Yeah, sure thing. Thank you, George, and thanks for the intro. And, and obviously, thank you for everyone who's joining in for this discussion. Uh, my name is George Trad. I'm the VP of product at Casisto. Uh, we could switch to the next slide, um, George, if you don't mind. A little bit of background on Casisto. Um, we, are, we are essentially the leaders in conversational AI and financial services. Um, and our mission is to humanize digital experiences in financial services. Uh, and effectively what this means is we want to empower people to get answers in real time from their banks, um, you know, in the most natural way possible to any questions, banking questions that they have. And that's, that's really through natural language. So whether it's through speech or through text, we want to allow banks to better service their customers and improve the digital experiences uh, of people on their channels, right, uh, through natural language. Our virtual assistant, Kai, has been deployed in 16 different countries with leading financial institutions. Uh, across North America, we're live with JP Morgan, TD Bank, Manulife in Canada. Um, you know, in uh, Asia, we're live in Singapore, India, and Indonesia with DBS. We're live with Hong, uh, in Hong Kong and with, with Standard Charter. We're live across Africa in nine different countries with APSA. Uh, we're even live in the Middle East uh, with Emirates MBD and Live, the mobile-only digital bank uh, in the UAE. Um, so uh, really just in terms of our product suite, we cater to consumer banking, corporate banking, investment management. These are kind of our, cre our three core products. But the large majority of, of, of our offerings so far and our live deployments have been in the consumer banking space and with, with a focus on, on text as being the primary way of, of communication. Um, and so just to give you an idea of scale, um, you know, we, we have answered, Kai, Kai has answered over 35 million banking questions so far. Um, and, and you know, as you can imagine, this is a gold mine of data, right? Uh, it's a gold mine that's growing at a rate of a million utterances uh, per month. There's 18 million people that have engaged and interacted with Kai. Um, and really this puts us in a unique position to you know, understand how people are engaging differently with their financial institutions during this unique time 
and the role that VAs can play in a time of, of crisis. Um, I'll cover some of the business outcomes that financial institutions are, are, look, are seeing from uh, deployments of VA next. But if you don't mind, George, if we could switch to the next slide. Um, I want to spend some time just covering just high level the impact that we're seeing in our industry from the crisis. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that call centers have been completely disrupted, right? Uh, whether you're calling an airline, your bank, your healthcare provider, uh, wait times are often over an hour. Um, you know, and, and there's really two factors that are, that are leading to this. On one side, call volumes are up by 30%. But uh, on the other hand, um, you know, another big consequence of the severe lockdown measures that have been taken across the planet is that agent capacity in call centers has dropped by 60%. So, um, you know, really, you know, a lot of companies have outsourced their call center operations to places like the Philippines, India, and, and people simply can't go to work, right? Um, and, and most of those people, unfortunately, uh, you know, are, are, are not equipped with flexible work from home policies due to various data privacy issues, uh, you know, and, and they're, they're not equipped with the right technology solutions to be able to continue to service customers, uh, you know, in this, in this situation. So just in, just in terms of what we're seeing um, you know, in our VAs uh, with, with people that are actually engaging with our, with our virtual assistant during this time, uh, we, we've generally seen an increase in 30, by, by 35% in just the overall usage between February and April. Um, you know, people are naturally going to the virtual assistant to engage with their banks. And it is clear that uh, you know, the, the, there's a real shift in and, and, and just the nature of those conversations that are happening. This is not business as usual. Uh, people are genuinely concerned. They're asking for help. They're asking for reassurance. We're seeing things like, you know, is it safe to touch an ATM? How often do you clean your ATM? How, uh, how have branch hours been impacted, right? These are the types of questions that people are asking. And this was like kind of like at the beginning of the crisis. And then, you know, it quickly evolved into questions related uh, you know, to, to deferrals of payments, whether it's an interest payment on a card, on a loan, uh, and so forth, right? Um, I mean, so generally, we, we, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, drops in types of questions related to, uh, you know, new products, new services. These used to represent a significant part of what we used to see uh, in terms of conversations with our virtual assistant. These have dropped by 20%. We're seeing people ask for, uh, remittances, how to make payments, how to wire, wire transfers. They obviously want to reach to their loved ones and, and essentially uh, have, get help making those payments. Uh, you know, it's clear that you know, these are difficult times for, 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 for most, of, most people, right? Um, and my hope is that with uh, conversational AI, um, you know, businesses will have the tools that they need to better service their customers in times like these. Um, and that people will be empowered to ultimately get help anytime and anywhere um, with the right tools. Great. Thank you. I'm going to move to Anthony right now. Uh, with, um, I'm assuming Anthony is Dex AI, right? Or is it Dex AI? We leave it up for interpretation. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Uh, all right. Thanks, George. Um, thanks, everyone who's, who's on the panel. My name is Anthony Tayun. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO uh, of DexAI Robotics. Um, the reason we leave it open for interpretation, Dex AI is a portmanteau for dexterous artificial intelligence, but at the same time, the word DexAI means catch in Greek. So it's kind of a wordplay on both. Um, and so DexAI, what we do at DexAI is we use robotic arms to automate food preparation in existing restaurants. So what you see here on the slide uh, is a robotic arm um, with a computing cabinet at the bottom and a few accessories. And if you imagine a restaurant like Chipotle or Sweetgreen or, re or really any place that has a, a, a serve serving line or an assembly based uh, food product, these robots can be placed on that kitchen counter, you plug it in and it just works, right? And the beauty of it is that it just works, right? It will never call, call sick, It'll, it will not contact COVID, it will not pass it along, and you get all these, these nice benefits of the robot um, making consistent recipes uh, all the time. We'll get more about, uh, into the benefits in a bit. Now let's go over how does this actually work, right? Um, and so on, on this slide here, you see on the left-hand side, uh, Alfred, which is what we call the, the robot, preparing a salad out of, a, uh, out of a, a group of ingredients in a bin. 
And so way this, the way this works, the robot has a camera on the wrist and that camera allows the robot to work with any layout. So it can identify where the ingredients are. Um, next, it picks up the right utensil. So whether it's a spoon, tongue, disher, and manipulates the utensil uh, and uses the utensil to do the third step, which is picking the ingredient. And we use artificial intelligence and machine learning across each of these steps. Um, some of them are a little bit more difficult to do than others, specifically being able to manipulate deformable materials. So think things like guacamole, right? Being able to scoop guacamole is an extremely difficult task, especially for robots. Um, and as you, as you probably all guess, in today's world, this is very important because everyone's got to eat, right? We all need to eat. And people are, are having more and more, uh, you know, the health perception with COVID is increasingly preventing people from going to restaurants. And we'll, we'll touch on that uh, in a sec as well. So, you know, we're doing, uh, we're offering this robotic solution for restaurants. How does it actually help them? Um, and there are a few benefits for what restaurants get. First of all, we have, we charge a pay as you go model. So we don't charge anything upfront. We charge only a commission or a revenue share for every item that the robot makes. So for example, what you saw earlier with the robot making a salad, we would charge that restaurant a 10% um, um, on the price of that salad for everyone that the robot does, um, which is significantly cheaper than what they pay today. Similarly, the robots will always serve you the same portion, right? If you want two grams of rice, they're always gonna give you two grams of rice. They're not gonna over or under scoop. Um, they're pretty fast. So um, 50 orders per robot per hour, which is around 10 to 20% faster than a person. And as I said earlier, it takes basically no change uh, to implement and set up. And you can imagine how that's very important in today's conditions where the whole world turned upside down, restaurants were affected more than, than, than anyone else. Um, and what we have on, on the next slide is really the depth of, of the effect or a few examples of the effects of COVID on restaurants today. Um, and I'll go over those quickly now, but then we'll get back to them, I'm, uh, I'm hoping throughout the, the conversation as well. So first of all, there's uh, reduced revenues, um, mainly because of social distancing, preventing people from going to restaurants, but even beyond the immediate term, in the long term, social distancing and just the fear of such viruses will mean that restaurants will have fewer tables per store just to, to distance them, which necessarily means uh, that revenues have to go down structurally. At the same time, delivery, delivery hasn't picked up um, as we expected. And so uh, restaurants are forced to cut costs, right? You can't increase your revenues, they're going down, you're forced to cut costs. Um, shifting gears a little bit, Customer perception has changed quite a bit, and I'm pretty sure many of the people on, the, uh, on this uh, webinar right now uh, share these thoughts, right? So people are scared of disease transmission at restaurants, be it between kitchen staff or from kitchen staff to customers. Football, foodborne illnesses have always been a problem with us, and if anything, COVID kind of shone a light on that and how dangerous and, and big of a problem that is. And so automation is also a favorable solution to, to remove those risks. And lastly, there are some operational changes that, will, that are inevitable due to the, to the scale of, of something like COVID, right? So just like George mentioned earlier, people are asking, is it safe to touch ATMs? I'm pretty sure a lot of you are thinking, is it safe for me to go to a salad bar and touch a, you know, a spoon that 50 other people just touched before me? And so uh, that creates a push for change. Um, it reduces adoption friction on the customer side, particularly restaurants. And it offers this great window of opportunity where people are more amenable to trying new things. And it's on us to show them the new things that they can use um, um, to push these technologies forward. So that's, that was the overview I wanted to give. And then hopefully we can touch on, on more of these things uh, in a bit. Great. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, now that we, um, we kind of heard a little bit of overview about your companies. Let's, let's come back a bit to what we're sort of the common topic is, which is AI or artificial, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So can you elaborate, each one of you, and I'll start with Johnny, can you elaborate on how AI is specifically implemented in your field and how critical such implementations are to your sector? So this is not necessarily for beyond, but the sector of telecom and, and just give, give, a, give folks a flavor of how AI is implemented. 
Yeah, certainly. So um, obviously, there's there's not need to spend, there's not a whole lot of need to spend too much time on on sort of measure, mentioning the scale for the operators today. I mean, if we just look at wireless operators, we have three today, right in the U.S. Each at a scale of 100 million customers, uh, just for for mobility. Um, the the operational landscape for for such a massive operation, especially when you have a very layered type of um, uh, set up, you know, the networks, everything from, you know, cables underground all the way to the uh, last mile antennas, radio, etc. So the, the operational structure of networks is inherently very complex, but at the same time, it is very structured, which, which lends itself extremely well to machine learning and AI. Um, plus, there's, there's a slew of standards and support bodies that, that help uh, facilitate this. So I'll give you a couple of examples in the sense of uh, just sort of grounded a little bit. Um, take, for example, 911 calls uh, that, that happen. Um, one of the things that telecom operators have to do is obviously they have to support your 911 calls, right? Yeah. And, and this has to happen under any circumstances, whether you have coverage, whether you don't have coverage, whether you're roaming, no matter what. So every device and every piece of equipment that goes on the network needs to be certified end to end to ensure that that happens. And this applies to every other service, but you know, just taking one example. So, but, and, and again, think about the, the hundreds of millions of customers that go through this. Uh, where, where AI plays a role is in the ability one, um, to ensure that the procedural tasks that need to happen in order to get these devices and equipment onboarded all has to be tested very rigorously, all has to be analyzed for every minute detail, and all of that we utilize machine learning and AI in order to, um, to execute. On the other hand, obviously again now, there's a lot of performance sensitive and business critical applications that obviously run on these connected networks. One of the things we have to do as, you know, George knows very well about this exactly that, that there has been an extreme spike in calls to care. And there's absolutely no way to be able to manage that kind of volume. There's no way to be able to react at the pace that's required to each one of those incidents. So we apply AI to basically prevent that call from coming in in the first place. Detecting ongoing issues that occur in the network autonomously without the need for intervention. Um, ensuring that there's a resolution that is predicted, the impact is identified. So for example, something happens on a, um, a core element within the network, who is it going to impact? Where are they? How bad is the impact going to be? All of this is predictive measurements that have to take place. And then identifying why it happened, what is the corrective action that can take place, notifying customers, telling them what possible impact could be to them, what could they expect, and also feeding downstream applications such as virtual assistants, customer care agents, et cetera, providing the right information that can be responded to. So these are just a few of the examples, but but the way to, to think about it is, again, what we're trying to do constantly with machine learning and AI is prevent incidents from happening. And when they do happen, make sure that the resolution and the impact is, is you know, resolution is accelerated, impact is minimized, and disseminate the right information. Great. George, do you want to take a shot at the same question, please? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, so, so you know, how do we build a successful virtual assistant, right? Um, and, and it starts really with, with data, right? Having a lot of labeled training data that's very domain specific uh, to be able to train models that understand what people are gonna ask you, right? Um, you know, you need really specialized domain, deep domain expertise to, uh, with very specific data to be able to, to, do, to do that, right? So just to stick an example, uh, something as simple as asking for you know, what's my balance, right? You can have thousands of variances for asking how, what's my balance? You could say, what's my balance? How much money do I have? How much do I have? Uh, what's in my account? How much do I owe? Uh, you know, it's really about having that depth of data uh, around a very specific uh, domain and intent in this case, like the balance inquiry intent that, that gets you there. And that's really the primary differentiator uh, when it comes to Casisto. Uh, you know, Kai is effectively pre-trained with a million of banking specific utterances. Um, you know, it has hundreds of intents out of the box. These are all grouped into skills that our virtual assistant is able to handle upfront. Um, you know, and, and the, so that's on the NLU machine learning side, right? 
Now, in addition to this, what you need is you know, essentially pre-configured reference conversational flows to get certain things done. So uh, now that you've understood that somebody's asking you about activating a card, uh, you need to be able to capture their card number, their expiration date, the CVV, uh, get the card activated, right? Um, you know, and, and that's really what comes out of the box with a, a product like Kai in the case of, of Casisto's virtual assistant. Now, there's plenty of frameworks out there, uh, you know, chatbot frameworks that uh, would allow you to stand up a quick virtual assistant. You could use Dialogflow, you could use Power VA from Microsoft. Uh, but the reality is, is that it is unlikely that these are going to get you to a full enterprise grade commercial deployment of a virtual assistant that's able to handle the hundreds of intents that you need in an actual deployment and the, the, the volumes that you're going to get in terms of variety of, of questions that are going to be thrown at it. Um, you know, some people have built it themselves and very successfully. Uh, Bank of America specifically is a good example with Erica, uh, their virtual assistant, but they spend a lot of time uh, and resources uh, you know, to get there and to, to do it right. Uh, with Casisto, you, know, you essentially get this uh, you know, solution, this product out of the box that gets you 80% there from day one and allows you as, a, you know, as an organization to focus your energy on optimizing the 20% to, to kind of meet your specific needs. Great, Anthony. Robotics, really? AI? <laughs> Which is a very obvious thing. Could you please elaborate again uh, for sure. those of us? <laughs> for sure. And I'll, I'll touch on, on the AI side for both the, the food industry and then robotics, because I think they're, they're quite different. So starting with the food industry first, um, the food industry has been uh, lagging way behind in basically any technology adoption, right? And a few examples that we can think of recently McDonald's paid $100 million to build uh, kiosks, touch screens. Just please picture this with me. This is a tablet that you punch a bunch of buttons and you get an order, right? They paid $100 million to get that. And so I think that reflects just how much the industry was lagging in terms of technology adoption, technology capability, in-house in ability to, to incorporate things like AI and ML. And uh, for the last decade, maybe all of the work in uh, AI applications in the food industry has been um, in a small impact uh, um, um, optimization solutions, right? So things like how do we make scheduling easier and more automated? How do we, um, um, how do we fix our operations in such a way to save 0.5% from our costs, right? Very small uh, boxed initiatives um, that are optimization based. There's been a little bit of work on the delivery side, um, especially with, with some of the assistants that, that both Johnny and George touched on, they were implemented in the food context. So you would order uh, on a phone with, with an AI enabled assistant, for instance. However, not much more than that. Recently, what has changed in the last few years is that we're seeing more and more hardware um, that is enabled by AI into the kitchens, right? So things from smart ovens that can detect the food that's being uh, cooked in them and has you know, a non-linear uh, non, uh, a non -linear distribution of heat such that you can cook multiple things at the same time without having to worry about things need to cook faster than others. Um, and most recently, we're starting to, to open this box of truly flexible end-to-end -end automation. And Dexai is one of the first solutions that can do that. And by that, I mean solutions that can be placed in a, in, a, in a restaurant and truly unlock the AI capability of, you know, you don't have to think where you place the plate because the robot can figure that out. You don't have to think on whether you put the tomatoes or the cucumbers because the camera and the vision is good enough to know that. And all, all of these technologies are finally starting to come together to, to enable a lot of, of AI applications in food specifically. Now, robotics, on the other hand, is also having a, 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 great, uh, a great time right now. And that's mainly due to advancements on the hardware and on the software side. So on the software side, for the first time, we're able to do things with computer vision. We're able to do things with path planning that let robots move like smoothly, as opposed to you know, the clunky machines that we used to see on, uh, on, uh, on uh, movies growing up. Um, same thing with hardware. The cost of hardware robotics is dropping 10 to 20% a year 
making it finally uh, financially attractive uh, in a lot of, of, um, of large automation solutions. Um, and I think, I think the last piece with robotics that really unlocked, uh, unlocked the power of robotics is collaborative robots. So again, we're, for the first time, we're moving from putting robots in cages um, and having people very far away from them to being able to work next to robots with people interacting with these robots, giving feedback to them and, and truly interacting with them on a day-to-day -day operational basis. If I, if I can add just a quick thing that, that George mentioned also that's, that's extremely important in the context of AI for, for all of our spaces, which is the, the subject matter expertise contribution when it comes to AI. I think it's hugely undervalued. Uh, you know, I'll give an example. We, we sometimes actually with customers, especially where, where there's, you know, to your point, Anthony, where there has been limited adoption of AI, there's this uh, almost surreal understanding of what AI is supposed to be. And when you explain the importance of subject matter expertise and humans in the loop, it automatically somehow feels like you have to defend it. When, when in fact, it's actually a strong point of, of and, and you see that, honestly, I see that for me personally, I see it a lot in, in a lot of the startups where you look at the structure of the hiring that happens where you see, you know, it's a company of 25 people split, you know, 20 data scientists and 15 others. And, and that balance always is, is a red flag for me because the, the, the importance of the subject matter expertise and the training of these uh, AI components is extremely valuable. And, and it's almost like it created a rush on, George, you've, we've talked about this, it's created a rush on data scientists similar to the toilet paper rush that's happened from COVID, where basically it's, it's panic hiring. But, but really, AI does not scale like, like regular development. It, it scales based on the number of problems you're trying to solve, but your, your scale in terms of how well you solve that problem is actually done on the subject matter expertise, your data labeling, your data cleansing, your data, data curation. But you can have one data scientist solve a very good problem for you if you provide the right data that you can provide. So, so I think just in general, when it comes to AI, especially in our space, I feel like the subject matter expertise is extremely undervalued. In, in so Johnny, context. Johnny, let me interrupt for a second. When you say subject matter expertise, do you mean industry knowledge? That's what you mean, correct? Correct, yes. In other well, words, I not just being uh, an AI expert, but rather also understanding what problems you're trying to solve in this specific industry. Yeah, yeah, correct, yes. Right. And, and, and I, I want to, I think you heard me say that before, about a year ago or so, when, when MIT created their, I think, AI labs or, or this, they got a big endowment, I think it was in the, in the billions, and, or it was $1 billion, actually, to build their AI department. I went to their website, and interestingly enough, they said that, they want to they want to make sure their students become bilingual and by bilingual they meant understanding ai as a technology and understanding a specific industry and that's what they meant by bilingual so to your point that's very critical and i think uh, a lot of people miss that and i just get someone who just knows how to code uh, or who has taken ai classes and assuming they can solve an industry problem so let me let me keep you, Johnny, because I'm going to ask you the next question. Uh, the, the, so, again, tell us, and I think you addressed that a bit, but how has your industry in general and your company specifically reacted to COVID-19? Have you had to merely adapt, or has there been major pivots in your direction? And again, I don't talk about, you know, you, you know, working remotely or all the basic uh, hygiene stuff we all have to go through, but rather, you know, from a product perspective or some sort of a, a pivot that you might have done? Yeah, no, for, um, I, I, think, I think in general, the, the, the hesitation for AI in, in, in areas that has not been traditionally implemented has, has been reduced quite a bit, I think. And, and part of it, again, like I mentioned, I feel like COVID has accelerated a lot of the initiatives around AI and, and its adoption in the sense that we've, we've, been, we've been preaching, obviously, because we're an AI, we're an AI company about how certain things simply cannot be done without AI. So there's certain scale that you simply cannot achieve with the sort of manual, primarily manual operations that existed before. And, and of course, we're delivering that message, but we're, we're sort of self-serving in the sense. But now, finally, we feel like people are, are starting to recognize that, look, this, this issue has hit us in a way that it's true. We, we simply cannot scale. 
and, and I really like the use case of the virtual assistant because it's it's one of those things that has I, I can imagine the spike in, in, in dependency on it is, is absolutely astronomical because again we're we're sort of before that 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 contact with the customer we're trying to minimize the load on those virtual and real assistants that exist. Now, in terms of whether we've had to pivot, um, not particularly in the sense, but we do see a shift in terms of the interest and use cases. Um, you know, we, we, we work across the whole domain, but the closer it is to basically reducing that impact of one, the distribution of uh, customers, uh, the reduction in mobility, the deconcentration of data, there's a lot of interest in those use cases. But to give one example, like that I mentioned earlier, you know, something called truck rolls is essentially when somebody, when they have to send a technician to your house for, uh, for a repair, those are almost dead completely, right? When it was a major, major functional component. So now the idea of maximizing uh, uh, the accuracy of when you actually have to send a technician to the site by using AI in order to identify the most likely cause or resolution to a problem, has, has increased dramatically. Now, now it's, it's an absolute need. It's not just about operationalizing, you know, operationally improving your, your bottom line by X percent. It's about, I have to do this, otherwise there's no way I can scale. Great. Um, George, you wanna take a shot again about AI and how your industry is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, how COVID, how you're adapting to COVID, I apologize. Oh, you're muted, sorry. Sorry guys. Yeah, jo Johnny was spot on. I mean, uh, you know, it, we have seen a spike in the demand for VAs and, uh, you know, as a result of this crisis and it is self-serving, um, you know, and, uh, but, but that's the reality and it's honestly not just us. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't always talk, <laughs> I, I usually avoid trying to talk about competitors, but, uh, you know, Life Person released their earnings uh, just recently. They talked about a spike in demand Nuance released their earnings, uh, you know, just recently, and they talked about a spike in in in, in, sa in sales, right? Uh, and so it's it's really across the board. But uh, I want to answer this question also from the perspective of how Casisto, uh, you know, uh, essentially reacted to COVID specifically, and not just the broader industry, because we'll get back to that. Um, you know, in the case of Casisto, as I said, I mean, you know, we're we're constantly monitoring usage of our VAs very closely. Uh, you know, and, and, and I, meant, I gave a few examples earlier about the types of you know, conversations and interactions that were coming in. Um, you know, and it's despite all of the talk about, you know, self-learning, deep learning, as Johnny said, I mean, at the end of the day, it does take a human in the loop to do supervised machine learning today, uh, you know, for commercially reliable deployments of a virtual assistant. Um, and that's what, that's what we do. So, uh, you know, we have teams of annotators that are constantly labeling data, analyzing data. Uh, you know, we, um, you know, and, and we are essentially retraining, retooling our models to constantly improve their performance and improve their, their coverage. And in the case of COVID, what we ended up doing specifically around this, as soon as we started seeing this, this you know, thousands of interactions coming in that are COVID related across the world, uh, you know, is, is we created an extension to our product, a new COVID skill, if you will, that handles six specific uh, you know, intents and topics, general inquiries around COVID, you know, payment deferrals, uh, you know, questions related to branch hours and impacts that, that there have been Im impacts to branch as a result of COVID, questions related to interest rates, questions related to uh, you know, travel insurance and people asking for refunds on canceled flights, uh, questions related to healthcare insurance and coverage for that from you know, the financial institutions that were um, you know, essentially offering this as well. Uh, all of this was coming, you know, as live data streams in our virtual assistants and we had to quickly react to it and effectively you know, quickly bootstrap a new model that supports that skill. Uh, and, um, and that's what we did. I mean, we did it in a matter of weeks. Uh, we ultimately extended this as a free add-on to all of our customers uh, globally. Um, and uh, we had, uh, you know, really great reception from that. And, and actually, um, you know, I could share an example of a major bank in the U.S., TD Bank, that launched this new skill, uh, you know, in a matter of weeks, right? I mean, this is essentially a major bank uh, being able to go live with an AI-powered virtual assistant, uh, live commercial deployment in, in weeks, answering, and, and that VA answering thousands of interactions every day, right? Uh, so that's how we reacted to it. Great. Um, Anthony, 
do you want to tell us a little bit again about how you've adapted to COVID and uh, what are some, if there are any major pivots that you had to do because of it? Anthony? Anthony, can you hear me? Oops. Yep, sir, I mentioned earlier, we had a spike. And, um, and also, can you guys hear me? Yeah, you're coming in a little bit cut up. I don't know what's going on. That happened before, even when you were talking. So I don't know oh. if there's anything in the background on your PC that's running or whatever, you might want to kill it. But okay. go ahead, we can hear you now, go ahead. Cool, thanks. Um, this is also another new, uh, a new use case to, uh, to explore in the age of COVID. Yes. Um, dr drop packets. Uh, um, I think for, for, <laughs> for us uh, specifically, it's a little bit similar to what George and Johnny mentioned, right? So we've seen a lot of uh, uptake and demand uh, and also the use case has changed a little bit. And that led us to do a, a slight pivot on positioning, but also uh, a slight pivot on the uh, long-term roadmap. So for positioning, um, you know, pre-COVID, um, the restaurant industry in the U.S. had a, had a huge labor gap, right? So there was there was far fewer uh, laborers available than what is uh, what is needed. Uh, Seventy-five percent of restaurants were understaffed. With COVID, sixty-six percent of restaurant staff were la laid off. So this is definitely not a problem anymore, right? However, the problem is the restaurants can't pay for these people anymore. Can't pay the payroll. Because revenues went down, uh, requirement rather than uh, rather than helping growth. Um, the other the other long term positioning is um, our roadmap was to first start doing the assembly products, so salads, bowls, and so on. But then eventually move to grilling, frying, and other kitchen activities. However, as I mentioned earlier, because things like salad bars and buffets uh, um, were highly affected due to COVID we realized that there's a much larger market opportunity there now. Uh, and so we decided to pursue that as well. I think both of these things, if I take a step back and think about them, what happened in the restaurant industry is that the, um, the name of the game changed from optimization to survival, right? And that led to a lot of things to change in the AI context. So as, as Johnny and George mentioned earlier, data became much more accessible. Uh, people were just, you know, We'll do whatever it takes if you can help us be profitable. And so, you know, they're running out of business. It's as simple as that. And so they're suddenly, they're, they're more amenable to giving you their data. They're more amenable to trying pilots and use cases. Um, uh, regulations became looser. So even the government is, is being more, more helpful in that regard. And uh, talent became much more available, which is a point that Johnny raised earlier. And I think on top of all of that, there was this big spotlight on all the things that were going wrong. Right, so we were in this delicate balance of things barely working, and COVID came and suddenly, suddenly, you know, shone a spotlight on like you have this big gap right here, you have this big gap right there, and and that made the value proposition much clearer to all of our customers. That's awesome. So we're running a little bit behind, so I want to go a little bit quickly. As some of you have addressed my next question, but think about it from your customer perspective, right? Um, uh, they probably perceived your product or offering in a pre-COVID way, right? And then all of a sudden, COVID came up. And I, if, is there anybody that want to address the contrast of how their customers are really perceiving their product in an incremental way, whether negative or positive, because of COVID? I'd be happy to take that, George. Um, just quickly, I guess, in the interest uh, of time. I mean, uh, George... Can you hear me? We hear you. I think this time it's George's fault. <laughs> George Akiki, sorry. <laughs> um, so hopefully everybody else can hear me. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, um, how did customers perceive uh, virtual assistance pre pre COVID? Uh, you know, it was really, uh, you know, it was really perceived as a as a, a cold deflection play, right? Uh, it was perceived as uh, a way to minimize the number of calls that are making it to a contact center of uh, reducing servicing costs. Um, and, and with every one of our deployments uh, of Casisto, at Casisto, right, we've been able to, to show tangible outcomes around this specific KPI, right? Uh, so we, we talk about containment rates uh, of over 85% with every one of our virtual assistant. 
Uh, and that simply means that um, you know, we're essentially able to answer 85% of questions uh, you know, by the VA without having to require a handover to an actual agent. Uh, and this uh, effectively has led many of our clients to, um, you know, to, to have essentially call volumes into their call centers that are reduced by as much as 50%, right? Uh, from launching Kai and have, having a, a successful you know, virtual assistant on their, on their website. But, um, you know, uh, you, can't, you can't really think about the value of, of virtual assistants uh, only in the context of a call deflection tool because really ultimately... Uh, what we also want to do is, is uh, you know, improve overall customer experience, right? Um, and, um, and we want to be able to, to demonstrate that, and we have been able to demonstrate that, for example, with uh, improved digital engagements on the websites and on the portals uh, and on the mobile apps of customers that have deployed uh, Kai uh, with up to 4X. So, uh, you know, I guess, I mean, in terms of the change in perspective, perception, I mean, for a long time, you know, despite all of this, virtual assistants were, were really considered nice to have, right? And that mindset with COVID is, is really changing. It, it's really shifting to, you know, with the collapse of the contact center, it's, it's really shifting to an imperative, as many folks have said, as an imperative from a business continuity, continuity perspective. You have to be able to service your customers and, uh, you know, you have to be able to do it you know, on good days and on bad days. And that's where VAs come in. Great. Anyone else has um, maybe something to add on this one before I move to the next question? Yeah, Again, I want to quickly compliment that on the robotics side. Uh, I touched on this a little bit from the food side earlier. Um, with robotics, it's a little bit similar as well in terms of, um, as, as George mentioned now, it's become essential and necessity for, for business continuity as opposed to a nice to have. And in the context of robotics, just think about the factories that are on lockdown right now they're sitting there with machines running OPEX costs on their owners and nothing's happening. Now think on that in the context of Amazon, for instance, right? Where not only do you have that, but you also have, I don't know how many million people depending on you and your operations for um, getting essential food products, getting essential medical products and, and things like that. And so uh, I think really the incentives just drastically changed from optimizing something that was working well or okay-ish to this is a must-have that we need um, to, to ensure continuity of our business. Great. Um, okay, let me, let me move to uh, next question. Um, maybe I want to ask this to Johnny first and see if anybody else wants to add. Johnny, let's back up a bit. Are there any new opportunities being created in your sector post-COVID, you know, has, you know, if you look down 18 months to two years when everything goes back to normal, supposedly, are there new opportunities that you can see have been created in uh, your yeah, sector? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, one, you know, b b Twitter CEO just announced that, that Twitter employees can now work from home permanently, right? So, Again, and, and the appreciation of this digital connection, uh, good or bad, is now you know at, at all time highs, I should say. So there's there's absolutely uh, opportunities to capitalize. Um, now, it's it, one thing I want to mention. There, there is sort of post near near term post COVID and long term post COVID that I, I do want to touch on. Near term post COVID, I think the telecom operators, especially the wireless operators, have a big big role to play. I mean, the name of the game now is minimizing disruption. Uh, right. So in that process, mobility is basically the biggest impact for us today. You can't go up in a mask. You can only go out and stay so close. You can't get into the store. You have to wait for capacity. So mobility is going to change. And obviously with that, mobile communications and, and mobile connectivity is going to dramatically change. You know, I, I think of a use case of, of contact tracing, which is a big topic of discussion now, which is the process of making sure that you can trace every touch point uh, of a person uh, so that if there is an identified case, trace them back to everybody they've contacted and whatnot. I don't know what the use cases are today. You can, we can all intuitively think of some, but obviously there's tons of those for, from a mobility standpoint in, in a sense. And to touch on that, the, uh, w the ante is being up significantly for the telecom operators in terms of the services they're supporting now. You know, it's moved on from, um, there's 
leisure and business to now all of it is mixed up in the same places forever, right? Th things, I, don't think, I don't think things will go back to pre-COVID normal from a way we do business, how we connect, how we connect, how we conduct business from home. Um, that's, you know, people are going to realize that things can be done in, in different ways and they're just going to continue that way. So there are opportunities. Um, I think there's plenty of opportunities and it's a matter of who's going to capitalize on them, right? The telecom industry could either continue to be sort of a, a, a mediator between the, the innovative applications and, 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 and content providers, or they could actually try to take a major step into becoming value added services over the top applications um, and, and capitalize on it for sure. Wow, all that and you didn't mention 5G once. Well, well, it's <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. You're not using cliches. <laughs> uh, anybody one else wants to take a shot at this uh, question about, again, post COVID, any new innovation or opportunities, I should say, that you see? I'm, I'm happy to take it. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, uh, you know, th there's no doubt that there's a lot of opportunities for many in, in the, you know, the customer servicing space, right? As a result of this pandemic, I mean, organizations are forced to act, uh, operating models are being rethought. Um, you know, just, just recently, actually, uh, there was an interesting quote from the CEO of Microsoft on their earning calls. Uh, where he said that we've seen in two years, uh, we've seen two years worth of digital transformation in two months, right? And that's, that's really the pace at which you know, organizations are, are really being forced to adapt and, and uh, you know, uh, as a result of this, right? And, and I certainly think that AI virtual assistants are going to be a, a one beneficiary of, of this dynamic, right? Um, you know, in terms of where, uh, you know, that industry is going, uh, I think inevitably over time, AI, uh, you know, will play a bigger part in, in the overall customer engagement and servicing model, whether it's customer facing assistance like, you know, Kai, uh, you know, these will only improve, they will become, uh, you know, they will be able to have richer conversations, they will have uh, more personalized conversations, but that doesn't mean that the humans will be completely, you know, put out of the equation, right? Uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably have uh, agents that, uh, you know, that the job function of, of live agents will, will shift. Um, you'll have, you have repetitive tasks that are done by the likes of Kai, and then you'd have agents becoming essentially the problem solvers, answering the most difficult, the most complex problems. And then that will probably require another slew of assistants or, or VAs that are tailored for those agents, right? For those humans and internal facing VAs. Uh, and so, you know, really, there's there's opportunities across this whole value chain when you look at it end to end, right? Um, that will be created uh, as a as a result of uh, of this, right? Um, and uh, you know, there's uh, there's definitely uh, no shortage of that. So let me ask a question now to to the person who's who's actually eradicating the use of humans uh, in in businesses. Let me go to Anthony right now. <laughs> I didn't Anthony. realize that was me. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, from your vantage point, um, and again, with the robotics in mind, what are some of the innovations in AI that are expected to yield good results and cool solutions in the future? It's a little bit different take on my previous question. It's sort of in general, not necessarily food industry. What are you hearing in the robotics world that are some big innovations coming down the road that you think are going to be so cool, like we're going to really see cool solutions coming out of? Yep, uh, for sure. And uh, and just to touch on your point super quickly, uh, the whole point is for robots to work with people, not replacing them, enabling them. Think of it as a as a microwave. Does your microwave mean you shouldn't be in the kitchen? Famous um, last words. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but and and to, to address your question, I think there's a lot of very interesting things coming together uh, in robotics. Um, and uh, particularly on, um, on vision, sing signal processing and manipulation and or controls. And I'll talk about each one of them very briefly. In terms of uh, vision, we're, we're being able to do things or machine vision is able to, to open new doors that were just simply not possible before. And you know, when we say machine vision, people, your immediate reaction would be to say like, oh, you can recognize shapes and what these objects are and so on. But I think that's really only scratching the surface, right? 
the power of machine vision is being able to show an object and then the camera or, or the system or the AI or, or what have you knows where to hold that object, right? And I think this is really where we start talking about the interesting applications of these things. And now we go from just an abstract image to recognizing what things are to going the next step and figuring out how to interact and engage with them in the real physical world. Um, so that's on the vision side. And I think this is, this, this is really huge and people underestimate where we are in that space, right? This is all very recent and it's happening at a, at a very, very fast pace. Um, on the control side, um, similarly, if people remember, the Amazon picking challenge is, is not that old, right? And the Amazon picking challenge, for people who don't know, is about a robot being able to grasp a random object out of a tote or a box. Um, and right now, you know, when this started a decade or so ago, um, basically no one was able to do it, right? Amazon was paying millions of dollars for people who can successfully grasp a certain number of unknown uh, objects before. And today we're also pushing that boundary in the robotics world on um, whether with us at Dexi, where we can manipulate things that deform, but also in other places like construction, surgery, you know, where you have surgical robots that are able to manipulate human tissue with, uh, with unprecedented level of detail. And, uh, and all of that is also happening at a very, very fast pace. And I think that the third topic that I touched on uh, earlier in terms of systems in, or, or integration or, or signals really is how do you bring all of this together? Right? How do you create a system that can see things and understand them, listen to what people are saying through natural language processing or other uh, cues, like when someone says, ouch, when they're scared or when they have a, a problem, right? Um, we humans have a lot of intuition and, and AI and, and machines don't. And I think now we're at this stage where we can pull a lot of different signals together to create or to emulate that intuition, which, which would let um, machines or robots or a any AI powered device do things that we were for a long time considering very human, right? And, and I think this is really like, it's very interesting that um, the COVID-19 crisis happened now because as, as was said on this panel right now, two years of, of advancements are happening in two months, right? And so just imagine what that means in the context that we just talked about of robotics, right? And, and where, where we're heading. You know, this is great. I was actually going to ask you guys, and I think you sort of an answered directly. I was going to ask, what recommendations do you have for fresh graduates coming out of school who studied computer science and maybe AI? What areas should they go into? But I, you know, we're running out of time, and I think you almost answered it, right? Uh, some of the cool areas where, where they, they should focus on. Um, what we didn't discuss today, and maybe that was not appropriate, is what are some of the industries that are being hit? even using AI today, uh, I keep joking and I say, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, cru cruise ship reservation type software or whatever. But anyway, we didn't address that today. We, we are coming to sort of the end of the, of the main session and we, we're gonna move now to the, to the Q&A session. So um, um, bear with us, um, let, we're probably gonna take 15 minutes to do that. And Najib Khuri Haddad, can you please now take it from here? and maybe walk us through some of the questions that have been asked online? Yeah, hi everyone. I mean, I do encourage you to submit questions on the Q&A uh, button here menu. We have uh, three questions so far. First from Alessandro Zreb for Anthony. Do you think that restaurants are going to have different priorities today in terms of budget spending? Do you think this crisis will push down, will hurt your business because of lack of capital or, or help it? Yep, these are both excellent questions. Thanks, uh, Alessio. Um, on the first question, um, if, you, if we take a step back and think about how or where restaurants spend their money or the cost side of the restaurant business, um, it's roughly a third on food costs, a third on labor, and a third on overhead. That's, that's been the rule of thumb for, for a few decades now. Um, on the food cost, the, any changes you make there will either um, directly affect your menu or will mean that you have to go through lower quality foods. Um, some restaurants are now offering limited menus to address that, but generally you can't reduce spending all too much there because it affects the quality of the experience, right? People go there to eat your food. Um, at the same time, the food industry or the value chain is getting a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, heat um, and is facing a lot of difficulties there. So we, if anything, we expect the food cost to go up and not down. 
um, overhead is, is largely related to, you know, you can streamline operations in some sense, but it's largely also related to the, um, the real estate costs that you have. And again, these are also going up, not down. And that's historical trend that's been going for some time now. And so you're left with really the biggest uh, cost driver, which is labor. And when you look at, look at it that way, um, you also, you need labor, right? You need people to make your food. Otherwise, what's, what, what are you doing in your restaurants? And so when you look at it from that standpoint, um, you get to the conclusion that restaurants have to save on labor. And one of the ways they do that is through automation, which is why uh, I actually believe that, our, uh, that the crisis helps automation, not doesn't discourage it. Now, your second specific question on restaurants being able to, to buy that automation, right? Because not only do you, let's, we agreed that, uh, let's say we agree that restaurants need it, it doesn't mean that they can pay for it. And here, I think the onus is a little bit on the automation provider side to kind of remove that friction, right? And what we're doing as Dexai, as an example, is we lease all the equipment on our end. So we bear the financial cash flow uh, risk and we offer our solution as a pay as you go model exclusively. Meaning we tell restaurants, we understand you don't have cash to pay for any of this. We will only charge you once you sell the food that the robot makes. This way you don't have to pay anything before adopting the automation solution. And, and I believe that's one way to encourage adoption of automation solutions, but obviously there are many others and, and we need to constantly think about them. Thanks, Anthony. Next question, uh, what is your, uh, maybe this is for Johnny, if you can take it. What's your view on the impact of AI and machine learning, particularly bots on jobs? And, and Najib, let me just interrupt just so that recognize who asked those. The previous question was asked by Alessio Zreb, and this yeah. one is by Mark Sven, right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I mean, I, 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 I do believe that there will be an impact uh, to jobs. There's, there's no way around it. Um, it's, it's labor arbitrage, really, in, in a lot of cases. Um, uh, for us, I mean, the, the, the way we position it also is that we are expanding the capacity for humans to execute these tasks. There's no question about it. But at some point, uh, our hope is that you will need less and less to a point where you will be able to cut costs in terms of job availability. Now, in our space, we're usually working with highly skilled, highly technical resources where there's always value that they can bring in other places. But in terms of the positions, um, that, that especially where we call repetitive task execution that takes place, those are the days are numbered for those kinds of things. In, in, in my opinion, uh, ultimately, whether it's us or, or somebody else, somebody will automate away a lot of these tasks. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Again, I mean, in our space, since these are highly skilled individuals, there's always other areas of higher value that they can contribute. But ultimately, you know, again, call centers, uh, chatbots are getting better. Virtual assistants are getting better. Um, Anthony's space in, in food, there's absolutely labor arbitrage there. There's no question about it. Um, I do believe it will have a, a negative impact on jobs that are lower skill for, th there's no question about it. Okay, thanks, Johnny. Uh, last question I have here is for uh, George. Uh, which chatbot platform you recommend besides uh, Microsoft and Google? Well, if you're a bank, uh, <laughs> the answer is uh, definitely Casisto. Is, <laughs> that's an easy one. Um, but no, I mean, jokes aside, I, I mentioned, um, you know, Google's Dialogflow. Uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, Power VA from Microsoft. Obviously, the, the third one in that trio uh, would probably be Lex from, uh, you know, Amazon. Um, you know, these are kind of like general purpose uh, platforms for building uh, virtual assistants, right? And, 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 you know, they work well, they work well, I guess, if you're, um, you know, if you can provide the training data, if you have the skills to build the conversational flows yourself. Um, but, you know, so, so there, there is, you know, that category of, of uh, virtual assistant or of, of platforms, if you will, uh, to build your own VA. Uh, and then there's others like Assisto that are more domain focused, industry focused, um, and uh, that come with effectively the prepackaged product, but also with the tools to customize it, to tailor it, and to extend it, right? Um, and, and so it's, it's really a, uh, yeah, it's a difficult question to ask. I mean, there, there's really a, a broad spectrum of, um, of, of options there. 
and it really depends on what you're trying to achieve and, and, and how. Okay, thanks, George. Uh, no more questions. I mean, George, back to you. Yes, thank you, Najib, and uh, thank you again for everyone to, for attending the session. Special thanks to the panelists. If you missed part of this webinar, uh, we will post the recording in 48 hours, and please stay tuned to other webinars announcement coming soon. I want to just do a cheap plug here. We're going to do one on 5G. It's going to be very interesting soon. And uh, stay healthy and be safe. And thank oh, you for attending. One more question that came. Oh, go ahead. We take it. Uh, George or Johnny from Joe Wehbe, can you explain the process of undertaking a POC proof of concept and how do you show business value? A rather virtual assistant? Go for it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take it. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, the, the process of, of, of showing value ultimately comes down to understanding the business outcomes that you're trying to achieve, right? And, and uh, you know, as I said, traditionally, the business outcomes have been around you know, reducing um, you know, servicing costs uh, by, by containing calls, right? Um, you know, it's been around uh, driving engagement digital engagement and, and uh, you know, driving potentially also a revenue generating uh, you know, experiences as well. So somebody that's asking you, you know, how do I uh, you know, open an account or can you help me apply for a credit card? Uh, you know, these are kind of like, obviously they lead directly into your funnel of, of leads, right? As a company. Um, and so as soon as you, you just understand those, I guess those, those three business drivers and you can, uh, you know, understand the value that a VA will bring to each one of these. Uh, you know, you can start pulling together uh, you know, a, a deployment of a VA that uh, you know is essentially in a pilot environment and that's managing measuring value against those three things and and pulling together the business case for that. Um, and and yeah, that's that's uh, that's probably the. The best way of, of starting with uh, essentially a, a, you know, a pilot that leads to a broader, you know, enterprise uh, commercial, full commercial deployment to all of your customers. I know okay. that Johnny, all he does is POCs, so you might take a shot at this, Johnny. <laughs> we do a few of them. Um, yeah, I mean, proving, proving value is, is, is always an interesting question. Actually, you know, quite honestly, in the last year uh, and, and at Beyond, we've spent a ton of effort and, and put a lot of investment in minimizing the friction required in order to get what we call the cost of value, minimizing it for our customers, right? Um, customers get interested, but as soon as it comes to them spending the time and money it requires for them to try out your product, uh, and especially in our space, it's not, it's not easy and it's not cheap. It's not a matter of, you know, it's not, you don't download an app and it works. There's, there's integrations, there's things to do. But in terms of what the process is, we've gotten very, very good at identifying exactly where we need, what the touch points are and setting up the processes required in order for us to go there and minimize the effort required on, on customers' behalf. Uh, one of the challenges we run into uh, when it comes to POCs is obviously we're working with very sensitive data for customers. In a lot of cases, that prevents us from taking on as much as we would like to, especially let's say from as a SaaS product, for example, where we own the infrastructure, we can host it, it's just send us the data and we're good, we're done. That's our, that's ideally how we'd like to do it. But the closer we get to the customer, the more there's regulations and hurdles and, and, and hopes to jump through to get there. But the process is typically, as, as George said, defining the business value that needs to be achieved, identifying the stakeholders and the assets that need to be uh, uh, managed, and, and then plug into the right places and minimize the friction in the process. Great, thank you. That's thank all. you, everyone. Again, um, thank you for attending this and uh, stay healthy, be safe. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye -bye.